Hi, Elad. Nice to be with you Hi. today. How are you? Fine. How are you? Okay, good. We're going to start this conversation talking a bit about your research that deals with the intersection of science, technology, and religion. Um, and I'd like to ask you to start by introducing yourself a bit and how you got to the only STS program in Israel, how you got to this research, and then we can dive into the actual topics that you uh, encounter. So I'm El Elad Kaplan. I'm the director of the Menumadin Center for Jewish and Democratic Law at Bar Ilan University. And my research is focused on religion, technology, law, society. I did my master's degree in the program for science technology studies, and currently I'm writing my doctorate in law and science and technology. So I'm kind of interested in the connections and the intersections between those various issues. Okay, so before we get into how you, what intersections there you focused on, can I just ask, uh, do you have a lot of uh, colleagues and compatriots? Is this a field that's getting uh, much more populated or would you, do you feel that this is a field that you're still sort of pioneering a bit? Are there? Uh, yeah, well, I think a bit of both. Thing. I mean, it is a, a new and growing field and I think the need for it is is growing. So it's still at its initial stages, but then it's branching out into more and more areas. Um, I got to the SDS program um, through my supervisor, Noach Efron, who was the head of the program, the founder and head of the program. And I read some things he had written on these issues of religion and technology and found it fascinating. And I think the more um, information technology and science is uh, surrounding us and connecting to different aspects and areas of our life, the need to understand the impacts on that are, are growing. Right. And just because we're starting a new researchers network, and that's the forum for our conversation today, MENA SNR, Middle East and North Africa, Science and Religion Researchers, I was just curious, like, are there other graduate students, PhD candidates who are working on similar topics to yourself at different universities around the country, around the region that you're in touch with through conferences? Yeah, there's a lot of connections, not on the, the same issue, but connected uh, issues. I'm both in law and science and technology studies, and it, it kind of it branches out. I think that what I'm currently focused on is the use of information technology and databases and DNA testing within the religious establishment. And that's been a growing issue over the past decade. And other people are connecting to that in different in different ways. But the wider question of religion and technology, I think, is definitely a major issue um, on the research agenda. OK, great. So let's dive right in. I know we have first year masters that you wrote a couple of years ago on a subject that is very close to my heart. It's very interesting. Also, you are a male researcher and you focus particularly in on feminist issues uh, a bit in your masters. So maybe you could begin by discussing that. So yeah, so my master's was uh, it was a study which dealt with the relationships between gender, Judaism, um, the internet, and focused on opportunities and challenges facing Jewish religious feminists in obtaining religious authority for women in online spaces. And the purpose of the study was to examine the ways in which um, female religious authority is shaped in different online spaces and how those different online spaces can serve the purpose of religious feminism in reforming the structures of religious authority, which is mostly dominated by, by men. So in the 90s, research about the internet was mostly utopian or dystopian. It's going to destroy the, the structures of society or rebuild society in this utopian way. I think that today we understand that it's actually more complex than that. And uh, we see it growing uh, over the, even over the past uh, decade. I'd say even since I finished the, the study, there's a growing uh, number of women within the religious sphere obtaining authority both offline and online. And that interacts with the way that the religious community and religious feminists use online spaces. So maybe the, the should I go into the different online yeah, spaces? Yeah, what are the differences between uh, how uh, religious feminists were interacting or gaining authority or, or not in, in virtual and non-virtual spaces? So I think my, I, my study uh, examines society not top down through the religious institutions, but more bottom up through the practice of religious women in different online spaces and um, the complex interactions between the traditional authority and women using those spaces. So the first space I reviewed was the online responsor, which is a space where um, 
people can ask rabbis, religious authorities, questions and answers. And since almost since the beginning of the internet, there's different websites in which you can ask rabbis religious questions. And in the initial day, this created a wider diversity of rabbis who are involved in answering questions. You don't have to go to your local rabbi in your local community, but you have more options online. And some rabbis said, are they actually, is this taking power away from rabbis because you no longer turn to your local religious authority and you have a wider variety of options. But it also increases the scope of rabbis in, in, a, in a way because rabbis can now answer a wider variety of questions. They have a wider reach to more people who are asking questions online. And they're also exempt from uh, some of the sources which they were required to provide in the past. They can just write what, what they believe online and it's seen to be kind of a religious uh, viewpoint. In these online spaces, there are- Why there would is they some... be less, uh, why would they have to provide sources less on- Well, the, the offline the response is usually based in religious sources. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a question, and then you, the, and the rabbis would connect the religious that? sources. Oh, okay. I would have thought it would have been right. parallel in that regard, also in the online. Uh... So on the online, it's it's actually in some places it is, but in many places the questions do not involve sources, and they just provide a short answer what the religious community or what the person asking the question should do. Hmm. So in a way, it makes life easier uh, <laughs> for rabbis, makes the answers shorter and also easier to read and access. But um, it sometimes means that personal views and beliefs are mixed together with uh, the um, knowledge, the religious knowledge, which is provided. So that exists both offline, online and, and online, but I'd say online even more so. Hmm. Interesting. So so going back to the question of women on these uh, online spheres. So there are women in some of these online responses, but at least uh, initially it was in very, very small numbers. Then there's different online responsor sites which were created to provide a platform for women providing questions, like a site called Yoatzot Alacha. There's a newer one called Meshivat Nefesh. But the way these sites work is they're sites where women can provide answers at religious authorities or semi-religious authorities under some kind of uh, responsibility of male uh, rabbis. And it's basically replicating the way questions and answers and religious authority and knowledge is provided offline. Well, did these online spaces not only allow for more women to answer questions, but what about asking questions? Were there more women who felt comfortable? Yeah, to so there ask has been some research online? about on that question. More the rabbis, there's more access to women to ask rabbis questions, uh, get a direct response. It doesn't go through their husbands or through uh, male um, representatives of the family who have knowledge. So it does give more direct access, but even though women are more involved in these online responsor sites, I don't think it creates a radical change within re the religious community. It kind of replicates the religious community offline. And inside different institutions, there are women with religious authority. And then the same thing happens online. There are women who respond to questions and they have authority. It increases the scope and reach of religious authorities, both male and female. And yet it doesn't create a radical change in the balance of power and authority within the religious sphere. Hmm. Okay, so, so you felt found a real correlation and replication, and not any any really uh, significant changes due to. Well, the obviously there are changes in the way things adapt online, the way the answers are provided, the scope of the questions, the issues which are being discussed. But I think that initially, the initial research on the online response, so the question which was asked is, where are people turning to? to ask a religious, what we call halakha question. Are they turning to their local rabbi or are they turning to a rabbi online? I think in recent years, that's actually changed. I think there's another question, which is possibly a more important question. Are they turning to the official religious authorities, whether through the online response or offline local rabbis, or are they turning to different sources, including online groups? So one group which was created um, called I Am a Religious Feminist and I Have No Sense of Humor was a huge uh, group with over, I think, about 15,000 participants in its peak on Facebook, uh, in which 
women shared their frustrations and challenges facing the religious community and religious authorities. And there were many discussions that went on within this group. But what I found in my research is that this group had also turned into an epistemic community. People, mostly women, were turning to this group, not only to share their experiences, but also to seek religious knowledge. And sometimes the questions being asked within this group were very similar to questions to what you would find in an online response site. So the question was no longer are people turning to an online response site or an offline local rabbi, but how different online spaces can interact in different ways with religious authority. And I think what was also interesting in this group is the way that the knowledge was um, created. There was a greater emphasis on personal experience, community knowledge, anecdotal knowledge. There, was, um, there wasn't a, a clear difference between people answering who had official religious authority and just people sharing their experiences within the group. This was a Facebook people, group? This is within the Facebook group, but the people asking the questions were still receiving legal guidance and direction in order to act within their religious practice. And their sources were being cited in addition to personal views by the participants in their responses? I, I'd say the social env environment which was created in the group really illustrates how religious feminism can use these online spaces to challenge and create alternatives to the traditional structures of the religious community and authority, which doesn't necessarily happen on the online responsa, mm -hmm. in which official religious authorities are providing answers to the general public. But on the Facebook group, then there's questions, there are answers, they're, they're kind of mixed together, and it gives room for experiences, feelings, ideas, and the knowledge of various women. And, and therefore, it really challenges the structures and the, and the hierarchies of religious society. And were there offline parallels to that? Because on the one hand, you're basically describing two different virtual spaces, one in which you saw a replication of the existing structure and system and one where it was really changed and challenged. So where is that also paralleled in offline spaces or? Yeah, I'd say there are similar the experiences offline. You may go and consult with a family member or community member with friends and not turn to any uh, kind of an official religious authority. But I think this is still happening on a much wider scope online because the community is wider. There's more access to a different different views. It also has an ideological basis. This is a group about religious feminism and then someone seeking answers and religious knowledge, which relates to their uh, ideology of religious feminism may find that on this Facebook group much more easily than turning to an online responsa, even if it's an online responsa which allows women to provide answers as religious authorities. I mean, I don't know if this is true in terms of the online responsa, were the answers that rabbis and women and others were providing there, um, were they assessed in terms of whether they were more strict or more lenient than responsa that were given in um other contexts, because I know I've had people say, you know, never search online for a religious ruling, just like you don't search when you, you know, your ankle is hurting you because they're going to say, oh, you know, give the worst possible diagnosis. You're also going to find the most strict religious rulings in some of these online uh, responsa. I don't know if that is, in fact, what you found or if that is an. Well, I didn't measure how strict or lenient the different rulings are, but the from like the, the way the system works, there were different answers provided. I think what was interesting in some of these discussions, there were actually rabbis and women who have a kind of a religious uh, knowledge who participate in the group discussion. But at some point they said, we actually want to hear a wide variety of voices, not only people coming from giving like a, a regular um, traditional religious ruling. They were looking for the experience, the feelings, the group knowledge, mm -hmm. but it still influences and has an impact on the practice of the people participating within this group. So they may share where the best synagogue to go to uh, in order to receive uh, the best experience of gender equality, or where mm -hmm. you can participate in the religious practice. Uh, this knowledge is being shared through the group, but it directs people in their religious life in a similar way to which traditional questions and answers in a online 
and or offline response and may may do so. I, I mean, I find this fascinating and also very much ripe for cultural comparisons. I mean, I don't know if you've had any collaborations, but I would think that this is a phenomenon that all religions and all cultures are encountering now. So to see how, you know, the Jewish Israeli case compared to to other cases to me sounds like a study uh, waiting to happen. So that's something that interests me. Um, and also- I, th I think it's also about the, the kind of challenges that traditional religious powers have to deal with in, in different religions. And one challenge which exists in different religions is the demand to accelerate the liberal integration of women into existing religious uh, frameworks, both online and offline. But possibly an even greater challenge is the use of social groups online to create these radical alternatives to traditional male religious authority. Um, in online spaces that really embody a new female authority with group constructed knowledge and challenging these hierarchies that form the basis um, of religious authority and knowledge. And how did you come to that, uh, that research topic? Uh, how did you find that as your master's well, it's really one of the most exciting developments in the religious sphere in the past few decades, the change in the way religious society works, the growing influence that women have within these uh, spheres, the involvement of, uh, I mean, in the past, only 50% of uh, of people were, could be involved within the religious sphere, and that is now growing and growing and more women are taking part. It's a really exciting development, which I think can have as a religious Jew, I think that can have a very positive effect on religion and on Judaism. Great. And although, as I said, I'd be happy to continue to talk about that, I know that right now you're thick into your research on your doctorate. So yeah. you may well want to dive into that and explain what you're working on now. Well, this is a very different question. It also connects between religion and technology and, and society. Um, I mean, my, my current research is it's about a very new development and a very old question. Okay, so the new development is the use of information technology um, and even genetic technology and that how that connects to a centuries old question of who is a Jew? So I'll go into some of the details. Right. I think there's, there's two main de uh, developments, major developments, which have taken place in Israel since uh, the 1990s, which have kind of shaped a new public and, and legal discourse on the question of who is a Jew. The first is the massive wave of immigration to Israel from the former Soviet Union. And this has led to growing fears within the religious establishment that there may be citizens of Israel who present themselves as Jews, even though they're not Jewish, according to the rules of religious law, according to halakha. It's important to stress there's a difference between Jewish identity and Jewish identification. Someone can have a strong Jewish identity, but then the religious authorities would not recognize them, identify them as Jewish. And in Israel, Judaism also has a status which has different implications, such as being eligible to marry through the state religious courts. So that actually has a legal impact as well. There's been very little um, kind of research about how Judaism is certified within legal spheres and within the religious spheres. And even though there's many uh, debates about different questions of who is a Jew, then this question, which relates to so many people, how do we certify Judaism and Jewish status, hasn't, hasn't really been uh, researched. And my research seeks to address this gap by examining the legal challenges that underlie Jewish certification procedures within the rabbin rabbinical courts. But then the second development is the dramatically increased capabilities of information technology and the use that information technology and forensic evidence um, has in, in recent years, such as use of databases and DNA testing. And this has been discussed in various public and legal contexts. Um, so what can happen within the religious sphere when we use databases and genetic evidence it can create what we call a datification of Jewish identity. A datification is when areas where we, which we didn't use to uh, associate with data in the past, such as Jewish identity, suddenly are discussed through the lens of data. 
who is a Jew turns into a question of which data can we use in order to identify somebody as being Jewish? And this raises epistemological and legal questions about a certain in truth while creating a nexus between religious traditional inquir inquiry and a new scientific or technological inquiry, which also raises questions concerning the relationship between religion and data and the place of science and information in clarifying Jewish status and belonging. And what my research examines is the different approaches within the rabbinical courts in light of the growing uh, research on datification within this decision-making process. So the more traditional forms of data, if you could call it data, people would bring religious uh, wedding certificates uh, to both, where there would be, you know, so signatures of parents or grandparents and, and the rabbis who officiated weddings. I've heard of people bringing pictures of tombstones from <laughs> Jewish cemeteries. Those sorts of sources are the more traditional ones. And now when you're talking about DNA testing, I assume that's very controversial, and I'm not certain what other forms of data you're uh, referring to now that would be new well, and original. Even before that would be we kind of dive into DNA testing, mm -hmm. then we have to ask, how do we know that anybody is Jewish? I mean, how do I know that I am Jewish? My grandmother was Jewish. She's told me she's Jewish. I know that she's Jewish. It's what I've been told. But how would I prove that she's Jewish? And even though Judaism, maybe it's important to say Judaism, the halachic religious definition of Judaism is someone who is born to a Jewish mother or is converted into Judaism. So then we have to know that and this could go back um, centuries and centuries. Even if I can certify that my grandmother is Jewish, my mum's mum, how would I certify that her grandmother, her mum's mum is Jewish? And we can always raise questions going back centuries saying maybe somebody wasn't really Jewish and Jews were on the move for many years, moving from one place to another. Communities were kind of mixing uh, with each other. It's something which is very hard to prove. So what traditional religious ruling has done in the past is basing the certification of Judaism on a foundation of trust. If someone says that they're Jewish, they have what we call a cheskat yadut. We believe them on their word unless we have reason to suspect otherwise. And then if people are coming from a place we know that most people are Jews, that will kind of um, uh, correspond to their statement that they're a Jewish. We don't have to check documentation and, um, and other forms of data. In Israel, the religious establishment is a, an official state religious establishment, and it uses... Uh, data and computers like other religious establishment, uh, like other religious uh, or non-religious authorities, and they have databases. And inside these databases, they're writing who is a Jew and who is not a Jew, according to their halachic rulings. Now, the outcome of this is that suddenly the database, it um, takes the place of traditional religious authorities. And if we can use data such as former Soviet Union clerks who registered who is a Jew and who is not, then why do we need to base our rulings on trust or on traditional religious rulings when we can use this data? So there's a wider question is when when should we use data? And is it is it using data is easier, right? There's more access. Sometimes we can say, okay, there's a piece of paper. It says that someone's Jewish. Why should we use our religious authority where we can rely on these documents? But then the what can happen is that somebody who does not have these documents, such as many Jews who had to hide their Jewish identity because of the Holocaust under the Soviet regime in the in the former Soviet in the Soviet Union, people didn't want to be registered as being Jewish. They needed to hide their Jewish identity. And therefore, they can't necessarily prove that they're Jewish if we're basing our rulings on data. And this how is... about the value of just something that used to be based on, on trust and acceptance and communal embrace is now having uh, being replaced by, by data? By suspicion, um, a system which no longer respects uh, people's own self-identity or doesn't even respect their word, but wants to find proof which doesn't always exist. 
And the more we use data, those who can't obtain that data may find may struggle to prove their Jewish identity. So this um, young guy I, I I met, I represented in court called uh, Oleg. He was asked to prove the identity of his great grandmother. So then he found some documentation from the former Soviet Union showing his great grandmother was Jewish. But then he was questioned if his grandmother was really the daughter of his great grandmother. And there was only one problem. His great grandmother was the only daughter of this great grandmother. And the rabbinical court wanted him to provide some DNA testing, which he could not provide. Uh, and, and there's many cases where this is occurring within the rabbinical courts. And the use of data, databases, and genetic uh, information is kind of replacing the traditional religious rulings. Mm. I had thought there was originally skepticism and hesitancy to um, include DNA and, and other forms of scientific data at first into the, the courts. I know you said that your, your project, you're giving an overview of, of different approaches to this. So maybe you could sort of introduce us to some of the, the different schools of thought and the forces at play at this moment on this issue. Yeah, so there are different forces and there's different viewpoints on the way that data and especially genetic information should be used within the rabbinical courts. It could create many challenges for the rabbinical courts, such as a child born outside a marriage may be deemed to be in, in non-eligible to marry according to religious law. And if we genetically, if we did DNA testing in order to prove he was born outside the marriage, there would be no, it would be very hard to find a religious solution where traditional religious ruling in the past said you do not need to test, you shouldn't check further than you absolutely necessarily have to, because we want to find inclusive, attentive religious ruling to allow this child to be part of the religious community and, and be able to marry in the future, according to religious law. But then we have other religious uh, judges, rabbinical judges in the courts, saying once we have these tools, we have the technology, which allows us to prove who was born to who, and in their viewpoint, even more so, maybe who has Jewish genetics, then we should rely on that first. That should be our first go-to in order to certify Jewish status. There's some research which has been done on Jewish genes and, and genetics, showing we can use uh, mitochondrial DNA in order to prove the connection of some Jews, mostly from uh, European Ashkenazi communities, to uh, kind of uh, grandmothers who lived a thousand years ago. There's a lot of questions about this research. Can it be used and to what extent? But what they're saying is that possibly we can use some of this research in order to help people prove their Jewish identity. Uh, that's the terminology used. But then once we're helping people to prove their Jewish ident identity- Meaning a person who DNA, maybe doesn't have other data- He doesn't have other proof. We're asking him for data. And you would use it court. only on the side to help people, not on a side to, to exclude, only to include. Something. That would be their claim. But then is that possible? If we're bringing data into the traditional religious rulings, the more data exists, the more we're going to turn to the data. And this is one of the challenges of processes of datification. Once we're using a, a mindset of datification within the within different uh, operations and, and within the religious sphere, we're going to be relying more and more on data. And it's going to swap humans as those giving uh, the, the main verdicts. It's also uh, perceived to be neutral. I mean, the data is neutral. He does a DNA test. The data exists, but it actually isn't as neutral as it seems because Data doesn't exist for all Jewish communities. It doesn't exist to an equal measure. The registration of Jews as Jews in abroad has been done mostly in the former Soviet Union, mostly by anti-Semitic uh, former Soviet Union clerks who wanted to make sure they registered who is a Jew. Uh, that doesn't exist for all communities. And most of those who are asked to prove their Judaism in the rabbinical courts are coming from uh, their, their Israeli immigrants, from uh, the former Soviet Union countries. So it's not really equal. This is playing out in different ways with different communities. It's the same with DNA testing. With DNA testing, there's not research about all Jewish communities. Not all Jewish communities are large enough to test their genetics and where they're coming from. And then not everybody will have these um, the, the same genetics as, as what they seem, what, what they decide is, is considered to be Jewish. 
mostly because of conversion. Many people have converted to Judaism. Within Jewish law, we see those converting to Judaism as being equal to Jews. There should be no difference. But they will never have Jewish genetics if such a thing exists. They'll never be able to replicate the genes which are... Uh, uh, within the which the rabbinical court would recognize, which means even a thousand years after the conversion, we're not considering those converting to Judaism as really equal in order in, in to certify their Jewish identity. So, do you see this sort of issue a bit as a, a marriage between bureaucratic issues um, coming in a different way to the rabbinic establishment here? Um, due to other legal issues and considerations, whereas rabbinical courts in other countries around the world are being less open to considering scientific data? Is there a big difference between um, cultures of where this data is being embraced and where it's being rejected? Well, I think different religious rulings in Israel and abroad have an impact on each other. I think what is interesting is that there used to be a debate about uh, religion and science, Torah and Mada, or Judaism and religion. Um, and those who were considered to be more modern, open-minded, were embracing science into religion. What's happening here is sometimes the opposite. Uh, those coming with an open, lenient viewpoint are saying we should use traditional religious ruling without science, because that will allow us to rule that we can trust people. And we can bring people into the Jewish sphere and not question them and not make them go through all this, all these procedures, which could be humiliating and disenfranchising them from their Jewish identity. While those who maybe used to kind of push away science and have more stringent views uh, in the past, they would push away science. They, they still have their stringent uh, and narrow viewpoint of Judaism are saying, yeah, let's use science. Let's use data. It's neutral. We don't have to decide on our own. They also have sometimes an ontolo ontological viewpoint of what Judaism is. This is connected to a more fundamental question. Is Judaism something which really exists in the reality within us? Or is it about religion, belief? Is it a legal ruling or is it something with which uh, exists within us. Now, once you say that there's a connection between DNA and Judaism, then that has a lot of various implications. Does that mean there's something which is essentially Jewish within us? Or is Judaism about our responsibilities and our belonging to the Jewish people, not necessarily the Jewish DNA? Yeah, what you're speaking about reminds me very much of research. I just heard a professor from University of Toronto, Elise Burton, speak about research she did about genetics in the Middle East and conceptualization of race and other things along those lines. And um, I believe she will be in Israel in May. So perhaps uh, the network could have a bit in, of an event where you could be somewhat in conversation with her. And what I'm curious from the story that you're describing um, is what is the, the balance of powers there between these two different different camps in terms of, um, you know, the way you described it, the sort of more inclusive camp, perhaps counterintuitively pushing back against the, the initiative to include scientific evidence, um, and the other camp that is embracing the scientific evidence in a way that you were describing as somewhat exclusionary. Um, does the camp that wants to reject the scientific evidence have a chance. A lot of times we see sort of scientific determinism in a lot of um, different scenarios in this world, where, as you said, if it exists, we must use it. Uh, and, and what kind of arguments or successes are the camp that's looking to um, avoid bringing this kind of evidence to play into these issues? Yeah, well, it's, it's a good it question. Out? Those different voices exist within the religious establishment and outside the religious establishment in the Jewish uh, religious world. And there's been some writing and religious Jewish writing about the use of information technology and data and DNA testing within different religious rulings. I'd say within the official religious establishment, those seeking to use more data and have a more authority in order to imply this, so they're, they're the stronger voices. And there's a lot of, this is a bureaucratic system and there's a lot of money invested in it. Today, there's people within the rabbinical courts whose main role is to research and investigate the Jewish status of those turning to the rabbinical courts. And they've created databases which are also funded by the state. 
And once those databases exist, it's very difficult to get rid of them because they rely on them more and more. Once they have uh, the authority to turn people to DNA testing, it's very hard to say to them, you know, you shouldn't do that because they find that easier than giving a religious ruling, which they would see would see as more lenient, it would kind of position them as more open, and uh, they want to see themselves as more stringent and protecting uh, not only Jewish law but also the boundaries of the Jewish people. So has the train already left the station then on this? Is this a sort of a, a debate that's been won by one side in terms of it already being part of the bureaucracy? And therefore, that was my question. What chance does the other camp have in fighting this if it's already been put into motion to a certain degree? And I wouldn't say the, the train has left the station. I think this is an ongoing debate. There currently are certain religious uh, people in power within the religious establishment, but things can change. And I think it's important for this debate to continue. Uh, I filed a case to the Supreme Court, kind of in my legal practice, which forced the relig religious establishment to abolish some of its databases. They had to get rid of some of the criteria which they wrote, which was deemed by the court to be um, to be unlawful, and, and they, they weren't allowed to do that. Invasion uh, of privacy or... And also uh, writing people who didn't directly turn to court within these databases, third parties, um, family relationships to those who would turn to the court. They still have a lot of authority, but the more authority they have, I think this is going to grow and it's going to increase. And and I'd say there's, there's room for this use of this datification, turning Jewish identity into something which is part of a data society is something which could grow and continue. And the moment this is happening within the official state religious establishment and it's determining Jewish status, but it still has a very minimal effect on Jewish identity. But this guy could, uh, could um, spill out of the rabbinical courts and the religious establishment into the social sphere. I mean, are we looking at a future in, where, in which when uh, you know, two people meet and they want to have a Jewish wedding, they're asking each other for data about their Jewish identity, their genes. In the ultra-Orthodox world, the people can be asking for DNA testing before they go on a date. I and mean, that's currently, for the best of my knowledge, that's not happening today. But if we increase the, if the view that Judaism is actually data grows within the official religious sphere, that could also impact Jewish society and the whole of the Jewish world. And we may find ourselves with a completely new definition of who is a Jew than what we used to believe in in the past and in the present. So it sounds like you're also an activist uh, in this realm in terms of the cases that you've brought um, to all levels of the, the court system here. Um, so first of all, that's just interesting to note. I know I'm also a graduate of the same program where you're writing your doctorate and, and the program encourages uh, oftentimes the synthesis of um, research and activism. So I wanted to maybe ask you a little bit about that interface. Um, and also ask how well known is this issue in the public? Is it an issue that's gained attention that has other people uh, working on it? Um, and how do you navigate that uh, that crossroads? So maybe I'll start with the with the last question of um, how many people know about this. I think not not enough. It is still very uh, considered to be a kind of a a Jewish nuanced issue. There is growing knowledge within the community of immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Um, and, and, and their children were facing these challenges once turning to the religious establishment in order to seek a marriage and also sometimes a, a divorce. And questions of who is a Jew and challenging their Jewish identity is for such, it's, it's humiliating for them, but it's also creating difficulties just receiving rights of personal status, marriage and divorce within the state of Israel. So there is a strong activist element to this whole debate. I think it's important to have a mixture of you know, the activist work and the research work and the, the research gives a foundation and a basis uh, infrastructure in order to um, seek activists' goals in a way which is uh, knowledgeable and rooted in, in reality. There also is a difference between the two. I'm very careful within my research to be fair to all sides, understand the complexities and uh, um, the viewpoints of both of those I agree with more and those I agree with less, and understand the interactions between them. I think that's also important 
just in the public debate to understand you know how we can uh um strengthen more lenient open and attentive approaches within the religious world do you think there is a chance for dialogue have you found openings of the camp that is more interested in focusing on the datification and the introduction of scientific um proof to be open to understanding the alternative point of view on these issues yeah absolutely i think many of those seeking to use tools of data databases and dna testing they don't have a full understanding of the implications of datification and the creation of a data society within the religious sphere many of them actually do want to help people they think that's how we certify jewish identity that's how the rabbinical courts are operating and let's help people by providing them with the tools the data they need in order to certify their jewish identity and the i could even point out that there that has on no, I was just going to say there have been examples of where genetic testing has been used as an asset. You mentioned the Haredi community where people meet through matchmaking. There's the organization Dori Sharim that has helped to prevent um, genetic diseases through the exchange or the knowledge of genetic testing. Yeah, well, community. absolutely. No, I think nobody is claiming that DNA <laughs> testing is always wrong. There's many good and positive uses for DNA testing and also within the religious sphere, and even certifying Jewish status then the use of DNA and databases and information has helped people prove their Jewish identity and receive rights within the state of Israel. So there's plenty of cases where people can say, well, I didn't have the information I needed to certify my Jewish identity, and now I do. But I think it's also important to look at the wider implications of using data at such a wide scale. Um, what happens to those who could use traditional religious ruling in the past in order to certify their Jewish identity but once all this data exists, exists, then we're not turning to that traditional religious ruling. When there was the immigration from the former Soviet Union in the 90s, then people turned to Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, who was the chief rabbi, one of the great rabbinical religious scholars um, of our time. Uh, and they asked him if they can accept the Jewish identity of those immigrating to Israel from the former Soviet Union. And Rabbi Ovadi Yosef said, yes, and you do not need information in order to accept them and allow every single man and woman to be eligible for, for a Jewish marriage. And yet today, as data has grown, people, even his students, are no longer relying on that attentive and open halachic ruling, but rather on the wider use of data. The um, glamour and, and of it, the irresistible uh, pull of data and scientific uh, evidence in the sphere. I mean, I, I think it's a fascinating uh, example of this. And that's why I, I was curious because of I'm someone who's also just really interested in learning more and more about mediation and dialogue. And you obviously come from the legal world. And obviously, there's a lot of good that can be done by bringing court cases and being very adversarial. But I was also interested about other modes, if there was also a push for for dialogue and meetings and discussion. Well, I'm hoping that I think this is the power of research. The people who are involved with these areas, seeing just a part of the picture, will be able to understand the wider implications. And even if they continue to seek data in order to certify Jewish identity, they may do that uh, in a way which is more ca careful or understanding of the wider implications. Okay, well, this was a very exciting conversation. I see that our, our colleague Raleigh has joined us here now for the very end. Raleigh, feel free to uh, throw a really curveball, hardball question at Elad for the uh, for the end of this conversation. <laughs> but I will say that uh, you'll definitely want to catch the the recording of what he said until now. He's spoken about his master's and his PhD work. Um, and it's all really Which, fascinating thank you. and ripe for cross-cultural comparison throughout the Middle East yeah. and North Africa and, and elsewhere beyond in addition. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to I wanted to ask you this before, and I'm sorry I, I couldn't make it uh, until this part. Um Alana, I, I wanted to ask you about what you feel about the, the um, comparisons between what you just described, the the data glut the 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 seen these days in um, uh, religious communities um, um, maybe saying things like this will um, uh, better my halachic um, uh, response to questions of you Hasid and so on uh, where you see the comparison or difference between that kind of, of data glut and the kind that you see 
um, in wider circles, uh, the proliferation of of uh, the data testing and its implications and its perceptions in um, in other communities. Yeah, I think there's, there, a, there's a lot of similarities and there are also some differences. I think that datafication is having an impact on, on many areas of our life. And there's been research done on the impacts of datafication on the economy and the health system, the educational system. I think usually datafication is not associated with the religious sphere. I think it's interesting to see the way that impacts religious beliefs. And exactly. in this case, yeah. the, my research, religious belonging and religious uh, status. I think it does yeah. connect to religious beliefs, which identify Judaism. We were just discussing some of this before with kind of an ontological naturalistic view of what Jewish identity is, as opposed yeah. to a, a non-realistic view of Judaism, a legal perspective of Jewish belonging and, um, and identity. Those who believe that there's something which is ontological uh, about Judaism and Jewish identity will be more inclined to turn to data, especially DNA testing, but just generally data, because they see it as, as neutral, as being a fact, as opposed yeah. to trust and identity, which they don't see as being something which they can trust. So this is enforcing views which are sometimes also more stringent and narrow on their definition of what Judaism and what a Jew is. Yes. And and th you see this as, as um, um, I mean, this is a leading question, but the, where does the slippery slope um, lead to eventually? I mean, because we have had, um, uh, you know, occasions in the past, historical precedent of what happens when uh, the ontological, the blood relation uh, approach, um, what it does to the to the character of Judaism or the character of, Ju of, of uh, Jewish communities. Um, do you see that happening within a data sphere which... which does treat data as fact, even when it doesn't deserve that, um, and it does uh, do, use commensuration as um, a new a new way of, of of using this metric. But does it go all the way? Does it go um, in in those historical directions? Yeah, this is something I've said to some of my friends and colleagues within the religious establishment. Just the registration of Jews, the the use of data, databases, DNA testing in order to define who is a Jew is something that many of our enemies. Uh, did in the past. It's not something that Jews uh, defined. It, well, it wasn't part of our self-Jewish definition. Uh, definition when um, when we relying on the registration of anti-Semitic clerks from the former Soviet Union who registered who is a Jew in order to define who is a Jew in Israel. I do see that as a challenge uh, to our to our identity and set of beliefs. So um, there is something about data which people are more inclined to turn to. But then, you know, is that really how we want to see our Jewish identity? Does that really answer the question of who is a Jew? And so then it is important to turn to traditional ruling. Traditional exactly. Religious so that's my ruling. last question. How do you, um, what kind of traditional, um, what kind of traditional um, um, uh, option do you, do you turn to that won't just be uh, ludistic? So, you know, Rabbi Yosef Karo, he's a rabbinical scholar, one of the most famous rabbinical scholars in the history of Judaism, lived in the 16th century and wrote the Shulchan Aruch, which is still today the most fundamental text for Jewish law. And he was, and, and during his time, many Jews were moving from one community to another, and they didn't have access to databases or, you know, even the phone or the internet in order to certify who was really Jewish and who wasn't. And he was asked this question, you know, who do we trust, who is kosher and eligible to be part of the Jewish community and, and marry? And what he said in the Shulchan Aruch, he said all families who identify themselves as Jewish and part of the Jewish community are deemed to be kosher. But he did say there are people we shouldn't trust. There are people maybe we should question their belonging and their identity. And what he said is, I'll say, I'll say in Hebrew, kol aposel acherim choshashim lo shemahu pasul. Those questioning other people, we should question them because maybe they aren't eligible to be part of the Jewish community. And I think by his meaning, what he meant was we should really have a foundation. We have to have a foundation of, of trust, which is kind of at the root and the infrastructure of Jewish community. We can't have a community where people are constantly suspecting each other and asking for proof. Are they really kosher? Are they really Jewish? Can Are they eligible 
to be part of the of the Jewish or religious community because that will just um, tear people apart. And I think part of what this, is happening today is... Do you see this is, as scaling up? The, sorry? Do you see this as scaling up? In the scope of you, the, the use of data? In the, in the scope of the, the structure of the of religious communities today, the way information flows today. I see I see the use of data growing, first of all, and today mostly within the religious establishment. Um, I don't think this is today part of how people define their own Jewish identity in any part of the religious community, both the more ultra-Orthodox or the more uh, liberal parts. Uh, but it is being used in a wider, um, in, more widely within the religious authorities. And in recent years, not only the use of data and databases, but also genetic information and DNA testing, which is still small, but that is also growing. Will that yeah. spill out into the religious community as a whole and people will begin to use a more datafied definition of who is a Jew? That That is possible. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Well, we are getting to the end of our time, and that was a very um, emotional and chilling uh, quotation that you just brought from Rabbi Cairo about how important trust is in communities and how um, how much of a misstep it could be to to go in a different direction and avoid that. Replace and, trust with data. Yeah, and if people are concerned about issues of of data and privacy and all of these questions in so many other spheres of our lives, we haven't even gotten ready to worry about it in the religious realm. So you are definitely here to to wake us up to to new issues that we should be alive and alert to. Um, so I think my final question is just, is there anything else that you want to add that we haven't gotten to, either from your master's, from your doctorate, from STS in general in this uh, in this part of the world or anywhere that you would be interested in for further research or anything else you'd like to add for the close? I, th I think these questions are going to grow in the, in the future and we're going to be asking them more and more. And it's important to have this network and group of people where we can create both collaborations and understand the different challenges and opportunities we face in uh, different religious communities and religious spheres. So it's, it was fantastic to be here and it's a pleasure to be part of this group and network. Thank you so much. And as I said, I will try to be in touch with you about a potential meeting in May, because I do think that could be a, a first uh, good connection. That would be fantastic. And looking forward to staying in touch. Thanks so much. And thanks Raleigh for joining at the end. I know Thank your, you. your Sorry. research is really connected to this. So looking forward to future Very much so, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks. thanks Thank guys. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.